So let's begin by warmly welcoming Johan Hari. <clears throat> hey. Uh, I'm really relieved about something, which is they give me this kind of, you see this kind of microphone? Because when I gave, did my TED talk, they made me wear those, you know those head mics? And I remember saying to the technician when he put it on me, you know, if you make me wear this, I'm gonna feel like Madonna. And, and he looked at me super intensely and he said, you should always feel like Madonna. <laughs> so now whenever I wear one of those things, whatever I'm talking about, I get this really strong urge to randomly sing Papa Don't Preach. Um, also, they said to me, you can stand here, but you're allowed to pace around. And I was like, I am British. We do not pace, right? <laughs> can you imagine Queen Elizabeth pacing anywhere? It would be like a betrayal of everything. So if I start pacing, you'll know I've been taken over by an alien intelligence. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things. But the main thing I want to talk to you about is the opioid crisis. Because I think we are profoundly misunderstanding what's happening. I think the way we need to understand the opioid crisis is to think about it from a different angle. There is a country that had an opioid crisis as bad as the opioid crisis that is happening now in the United States, and they solved that crisis. And they did it by doing the opposite of what we're doing now. That country is Switzerland. I'm a citizen of that country, as well as having this weird Downton Abbey accent because my dad's from Switzerland. I've spent a lot of time there. But to explain what happened in Switzerland and how I think we can understand it, I just have to step back a second. I'm going to recap. Apologize to anyone who's seen my TED talk, but I just want to recap a little aspect of that, which is one of the reasons I care about this is for a very personal reason. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to. And I didn't understand why then, because I was a little boy. But as I got older, I realized we had addiction in my family. Drug addiction, actually the first drug of choice for the first of my relatives to become addicted was a prescription drug. It wasn't opioids because those weren't available then, but it was Valium, which is not so, not so dissimilar, and then uh, addiction kind of mutated from there. And, and when I started, eight years ago when I started writing my book, Chasing the Scream, about this, I was in that state that a lot of people who love someone who's got an addiction problem are in a lot of the time, if we're honest, which is I was very internally conflicted. Part of me was really angry. There was a part of me that had those kind of drug war voices in my head, looking at the people I loved, thinking, somebody should just stop you. And then there was another part of me that was thinking, right, people have tried that. It's clearly not working. Um, clearly, this is coming from a place of suffering and trying to be more loving and compassionate. But I really didn't know what to do. So I ended up going on a big journey over 30,000 miles. I wanted to go to the countries that had the toughest possible drug policies, so I went out in Arizona with a group of women who were made to go out on a chain gang wearing t-shirts saying I was a drug addict while members of the public mocked them and jeered at them. I went to Vietnam where people with addiction problems uh, sent to forced labor camps. And I went to the places that had the most compassionate policies. I'll get to them in a minute. And I learned a huge amount about these questions. But, but when it comes to addiction, it was very challenging because I realized I had profoundly misunderstood the thing that I had seen happening right in front of me all my life. So if you had asked me at the start of that journey, what causes, let's say, heroin addiction, because that was close to me, I would have looked at you like you were an idiot, and I would have said, the clue's in the name, dummy. Heroin addiction is obviously caused by heroin. We've been told this story for 100 years that's become totally part of our common sense, right? Um, it was certainly part of mine. If so we think if we kidnapped the next 20 people to walk past this conference center and we injected them all with heroin every day for a month like a, a villain in a Saw movie, at the end of that month, they'd all be heroin addicts for a simple reason. There's chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to desperately physically need. They'd have this tremendous physical hunger for heroin. And that's what the addiction is, right? That's, without having thought about it too much, that's basically what I thought. Um, the first time, first thing that alerted me to the fact there's something wrong in that story is when it was explained to me, in Britain, where I'm from, if you step out into the street and you get hit by a truck and you break your hip, you'll be taken to hospital and you'll be given a lot of a drug called diamorphine for the pain. Diamorphine is heroin, right? It's the medical name for heroin. It's much better heroin than you're going to store on the streets because it's medically pure, right? Uh, people in British hospitals are given that 
for quite long periods of time. If anyone here has a British grandmother who's had a hip replacement operation, your grandmother has taken a lot of heroin. If what we, <laughs> if what we think about addiction is right, that it's caused primarily by exposure to the chemical hooks, what should be happening to all these people in hospitals in Britain? Significant numbers of them should be leaving hospital with an addiction. They should be trying to score on the streets. This has been studied very carefully. It virtually never happens. And when I learned that, I thought, well, that, that can't be right. How can you have a situation where you've got someone in a hospital bed being given very potent, medically pure heroin, they don't become addicted, and you've got someone in the alleyway outside the hospital shooting up in the alleyway who does become addicted? How can that be? I didn't understand it because I thought addiction was mainly driven by the chemical hooks. I only began to understand it when I went to Vancouver and interviewed an incredible man called Professor Bruce Alexander, who did an experiment that should transform how we think about addiction and has in the countries that are successfully beating their addiction epidemics. So Professor Alexander said to me, this story we have in our heads, that addiction comes primarily from the chemical hooks, comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. You guys can try them at home if you're feeling a little bit sadistic. You take a rat, you put it in a cage, and you give it two water bottles. One is just water, the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself. So there you go, right? That's our story. But in the 1970s, Professor Alexander was working with people with addiction problems. He thought, it's not right here. He decided to do this experiment because he looked at it and said, well, hang on a minute. You put the rat alone in an empty cage where it has got nothing that makes life meaningful for rats. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically heaven for rats, right? They got loads of friends, they got loads of cheese, they got loads of colored balls, they could have loads of sex. Anything <laughs> a rat could possibly want in life is there in Rat Park. And they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water. And this is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They hardly ever use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. So you go from almost 100% compulsive use and death when they do not have the things that make life meaningful to none when they do have the things that make life meaningful for them. Now, one of the things I took from this, there's many human examples, I'm gonna to get to one in a minute, but one of the things I took from this is the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. The environment doesn't explain everything about addiction, but it's a massive driving force. And one of the ways we know this is because of a country that used these insights to end its opioid crisis. And end is not an exaggerated word. So Switzerland, by the year 2000, had a nightmare opioid problem. Some people will remember news reports from the time of like Swiss parks where people are like openly injecting in the neck, in the street, like horrifying scenes. And that would be bad in any country, but Swiss people are super obsessed with order. It's not a coincidence they invented clocks. So to them, like this is like hell, right? And Swiss people, Switzerland is a right-wing country. Um, if Switzerland were a state in the union, it would be Utah. Uh, you know, so not like, it's not a poor right-wing state, it's a wealthy right-wing state, but, you know. Um, and Switzerland tried the kind of things that are, in fact, being tried in Utah. Mass incarceration, punishment, the police chasing people around, arresting them, shaming them, the whole society shaming people. And every year, the problem got worse. Until finally, they got their first ever female president, something you guys might want to try one day, by the way, just saying. Uh, uh, an incredible, an incredible woman called Ruth Dreyfus, who's my candidate for president of the world. And she took over, she was initially the health minister, and then she was the president. <clears throat> and she explained to Swiss people, okay, what I think the solution to this is, in part, is legalizing, hero legalizing heroin for people with addiction problems. And she said, I know that sounds really shocking, because when you hear the word legalization, what you picture is like, anarchy and chaos. What she explained to the Swiss people is, what we have now with the drug war is anarchy and chaos. We have unknown criminals selling unknown chemicals to unknown drug users 
all in the dark, no support, all filled with violence, disease, and chaos. Legalization, she said, is the way we are going to restore order to this chaos. Now, it's important to understand what she did and didn't mean. I don't know the rules in Tennessee, but I'm pretty sure here it is legal to own a dog, a monkey, and a lion. But I'm pretty sure the rules are different, right? If you want to own a dog, I'm sure you can just go into a store. If you want, if you want to own a monkey, there's probably have to get a license. And if you want to own a lion, I'm sure they come and like inspect your house, make sure you're not a crazy person, right? In the same way, legalizing drugs means different things according to the risk, right? So nobody in Switzerland was proposing there should be like a heroin aisle in CVS. The way it works is, the way it works is, if you've got a heroin problem, you're offered a range of services, one of which is abstinence-based care, which is absolutely right for some people. And one of the options is that you can be assigned to a legal heroin clinic. I spent a lot of time in the one in Geneva. So, if you're assigned to this clinic, you go at seven o'clock in the morning, because Swiss people believe in doing things insanely early. This is a big disagreement between me and my dad. Um, you go at seven o'clock in the morning, you go in, they give you medically pure heroin there. You can't take it out with you, partly because they don't want you to sell it on, but mainly because they want to check you're okay. They will give you any dose you ask for, except, the one, except for one that would kill you. You use your heroin there, and then you leave and you go to your job because you're given loads of support to get work, to get housing, you're given extensive therapy to deal with the deep underlying pain that made you want to be addicted in the first place, that trapped you in addiction. That The Swiss theory based on Rat Park was that the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be. Once you understand that, you can see why punishment makes everything worse. Because if pain is the driver of addiction, Imposing more pain and more punishment doesn't just fail, it makes the problem worse. Those women in Arizona that I went, that I went out with on that chain gang, it's not true to say the drug war fails them, it makes the problem worse. They're even more shamed and humiliated and, and broken when they leave and even more likely to seek out pain-killing drugs. So the Swiss system is based on the opposite of that idea. Massive amounts of support. And there were a few things that really shocked me about this program. So I spent obviously spent a lot of time talking to the people there. And the... There is never any pressure to cut back. You set your own dose. Um, you can stay on that program for your whole life if you want to. And yet I went there, it had been in place for 13 years by the time I arrived, and there were like three people who'd been on the program at the start who were still on it. Almost everyone in that program chooses to cut back their heroin use over time and stop. And I remember saying to the chief psychiatrist there, Rita Mangi, well, how can that be? That doesn't make sense. Because we're told the drug takes you over, you need more and more of it. Uh, if you had a free unlimited supply, why would, you, why would you stop? And she looked at me like I was an idiot and she said, well, we help them so their lives get better. And as your life gets better, you don't want to be anesthetized so much. Which seems kind of stupidly obvious when it's said to you and yet is completely the opposite of the system that we've built in many places, against the wishes of many of the people in this room, obviously, who fight for much more compassionate policies. The results of the Swiss program are in. They are unequivocal. Professor Ambrose Uchtenhagen, Dr. Barbara Browers, very distinguished academics, have done detailed studies of this. In the 15 years now, since Switzerland legalized heroin, does anyone want to guess how many people have died of heroin overdoses on legal heroin in Switzerland? Anyone want to shout out a number? Not a single human being. I've been speaking to you for 10 minutes. Far more people have died in the United States in the 10 minutes I've been speaking to you of heroin overdoses than have died on legal heroin in Switzerland in the 15 years it has been legal. And so nobody has died on the illegal heroin, on the legal heroin and the illegal market has massively fallen and collapsed because people transfer into the legal, legal program because who wants to be chasing around buying shitty contaminated heroin when you could be getting both the legal medically pure stuff and loads of love, support, and help to turn your life around. Now, think about that Swiss program. And by the way, it's worth stressing as well, the, um, the, the Switzerland, are, the, as you can imagine, this was super controversial when President Dreyfus introduced it. But in Switzerland, it's very easy to have a referendum. Swiss people had a referendum on this. They voted on whether to keep it in place. 70% of Swiss people voted to keep this program legal. Not because they're so compassionate, they're not. My Swiss relatives make Donald Trump look like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. It, <laughs> it, it was that crime fell so much. 
there was an enormous fall in all forms of crime. And it's so much cheaper to give people love, support, and help than to imprison them, right? Um, after... <laughs> Late in her presidency, Ruth went to one of the heroin clinics in Geneva. Actually, she now lives almost directly opposite that clinic, which I think tells you something. And she was being shown around, and she was chatting to the people there. And a guy came up to her, and he handed her a note. And he said, don't read it now. Read it later. And he ran off. So she goes back to her office, the president's office. She's sitting there. She reads the note. And the guy says, um, I'm really grateful to you that you did this. I was homeless, I was in a really bad way, and this clinic helped me turn my life around. And I'm not sure whether I should tell you this, but if you walk directly out of your office and go two doors down, all the people who work in that office, you'll see me there because I now work for you in the president's office. Um, the transformation of people's lives that I saw in Switzerland and in all the countries that adopted more compassionate drug policies was incredible. But just think about the Swiss program, two planks. Give people the safest possible version of the drug, give them massive amounts of practical support to change their lives until they no longer feel they need the drug, right? We are doing exactly the opposite. If you are discovered, if it's discovered that you have an addiction problem and you're not just using for pain, you're using, not just using for physical pain, but for psychological pain, your doctor by law has to cut you off. That is the law. They can go to prison if they don't do that. So far from giving them the safest version of the drug, we take away the safest version of the drug. And far from giving you love and support and help to reconnect, we give you a criminal record, we shame you, we stigmatize you, we put barriers between you and getting back to a normal life. We are doing the opposite of the society that succeeded, and you guys work with the results every day. There's also a deeper layer of this. So Angus Dayton and Anne Case, Professor Anne Case, did a really detailed analysis. Where is the opioid crisis happening? Where is it worst? It's happening in the places where non-opioid-based suicide is highest, where depression is highest, where people have been deprived of the things that make life meaningful, where, where you know, their, their lives are much more like those isolated rats in those cages that guaranteed addiction are much less like Rat Park. We need to understand the deep underlying drivers of this addiction crisis. The pain that people are exhibiting in this society makes sense. It's not a malfunction. It's not because they're weak. It's not because they're crazy. We have built a society that does not meet people's psychological needs. Everyone in this room knows they've got natural physical needs. You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air. If I took those things away from you, you'd be in real trouble real fast. There is equally strong evidence that all human beings have natural psychological needs. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people love you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And this culture we built is good at lots of things. I'm glad to be alive today. But we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deep underlying psychological needs. And we need to stop. One of the tragedies of our drug policy is that we've been copying the countries that have disastrously failed. I think we need to start copying the countries that have succeeded in reducing addiction crises. And And if you want to understand why so many people are using so many painkillers, we've got to start understanding why they're in such pain. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>